It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. Today, God willing, I'd like to talk to you from Revelation 7 through 11. And uh, that'll be great if we can cover that territory. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open to Revelation chapter 7. This is where you find the passage dealing with the subject of the 144,000. Now I'll probably say a little more about chapter 7 than uh, uh, some of the other chapters because um, the 144,000 are not only mentioned in chapter 7, they're also mentioned in our scripture reading, chapter 14, first few verses there, verses 1 through 5. And so uh, there's quite a bit, a lot of discussion on who are the 144,000. So let's read chapter 7, verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tr children of the tribes of Israel. And then it lists, uh, to avoid being redundant, 12,000 from 12 tribes. Those tribes being Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Two tribes are left out. Dan and Ephraim, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, uh, there's a lot more information than I can cover during an overview like this, and we want to sort of uh, create a thirst in your minds and your mouth for more of Revelation. There's a website that has a lot more information, including a book called Who Are the 144,000? There's a whole sermon there just on the 144,000. And that new website is called Bible Prophecy Truth. There's a lot of information there on Revelation and some of these other uh, stories. Some of the, um, the notes that I'm going to share with you today about the 144,000, there's a whole book in there on that, and you'll be able to copy that. Uh, so that'll be an easy way for you to get those uh, notes and that material. One of the keys, I think, to understanding Revelation, of course, is to compare it with other verses in the Bible. When you look in the Old Testament, first of all, when you think about the 144,000, one thing stands out, it's, it's an odd number. It's 12 times 12,000. The number 12 in the Bible is symbolic of God's church. You've got the 12 uh, tribes in the Old Testament, the 12 apostles in the New Testament, woman in Revelation 12 with 12 stars above her head. Above the head means leadership. And so don't forget that. The 12 stars above the head, leadership interesting story in the Bible in uh, Mark chapter 5 where you've got Jesus goes to he raise a girl who has died. She is 12 years old. On the way, a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, she touches him. Those two women sort of represent the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. They both touch Jesus that day and find life in healing. That first woman continual flow of blood, but just grew worse, represents the sacrificial system that cannot wash away our sins. That little girl, she is touched by Jesus, and he says, feed her, represents the New Testament church. When he rose, he kept feeding her on the word. And so you'll find 12 often represents the church and the leadership. In the Old Testament, you find the number 12 connected with the army, or the 144,000 actually is connected with the army and with the priesthood. David had two groups of 144,000, which is 24,000, that served in the army in rotations of 12 hours. And then you find that the priesthood had two groups of, well, there they were 24,000, cut that in half, 
144,000 times 2. Am I getting that right? 144,000 times 2, 288. I knew I was doing that wrong. 288,000. Uh, David and the priests had, and he cut that in half, 144,000. So one was dedicated to praising in the temple, the other were the army. You're a nation of soldiers and priests. And so that number is a little clue. Now, just to give you a quick uh, answer to who I think the 144,000 are, one of the keys can be found in the book of Acts chapter 1. Why did Jesus pick 12 apostles? Was it literally 12 or was that a symbolic number? It's 12. Do we know what their names were? Yeah. Those 12 apostles were the leadership of Jesus' church. Now there was a problem. In the upper room before Pentecost, how many apostles were there? 11. Judas hung himself. Did the disciples see that as a problem? Did they think that retaining the number was important? They said, it's important that we replace Judas. So they said, let's get two more. We'll have 13. Or why don't we make it 14? No, they said, one more. Let's stick with the number Jesus chose. And they picked two. They said, let's pick one of those two. They cast lots. They picked Matthias. As soon as they had replaced that missing one, you then go to chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit is poured out, and the church explodes. That number represents something. Were there only 12 apostles, or I'm sorry, were there only 12 in the upper room that received the Holy Spirit? No, there was 120. But that 12 had a unique relationship. So one of the questions that we get, obvious questions are, why four angels? Four angels holding back the four winds. Four winds represented north, south, east, and west. Revelation is telling us that there is a terrible judgment that is about to come on the world. These winds of strife, these terrible judgments and plagues and trumpets are going to come upon the world. But before those things happen, there must be a sealing among God's people. And so here you've got pictured these four angels holding back these judgments. It is so important that God's people are sealed. And then it talks about the seal of God. And I need to quickly uh, address what that is. In the Bible, you can read, for instance, in um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So for one thing, everybody that gets the seal of God in Revelation has the Holy Spirit. We all together on that? You're not going to have people that will have the Holy Seal of God without the Holy Spirit. And then Isaiah 8:16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Now the most concise declaration of God's law is the Ten Commandments. He there in about 300 words gives his perfect will. In the middle of his law, in the longest of his commandments, you find the word holy one time. God's people are called to be holy filled with the Holy Spirit and in the fourth commandment where it says that the Sabbath is holy. You know there's only one time, one phrase that is attributed to God three times there in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy and then a third time holy is the Lord. It doesn't ever say love, love, love is God or grace, grace, grace is God. God identifies himself as an awesome and a holy God. He tells us that there is a commandment that is especially holy because life is made of time and one commandment revolves around holy time with a holy God. What a privilege that we could be invited to worship God on a holy day. People think, oh, what difference does it make what day? Well, you're probably saying, what difference does God's word make? It does make a difference. God is holy. And the law of God is to be sealed among his disciples. That means that they worship the true God. What is the battle about in the last days? Who do you worship? Two brothers of Adam and Eve in the beginning worshipped. They both claimed to worship the same God, but one did it his way. He said, it doesn't matter if I alter the worship a little bit and do it my way. And the other worshipped God's way. And the one who was wrong in his worship persecuted the one who was right in his worship 
Is that going to repeat itself in the last days? Yeah, both claiming to worship the same God. And so it does make a difference. The seal of God is placed on those who worship the way God said. By the way, in Ezekiel 9, it says there, there is a mark that is placed on the heads of those who are before the house of God that sigh and cry because of sin. They worship a holy God. They are sealed and protected against the judgments that come where the angel of judgments come through and they slay utterly old and young. So in the same way in Revelation, these angels of judgment are being held back until there is a seal in the foreheads of God's people. All of these prophecies in the Bible sort of inter, they're connected like your brain cells. Hopefully they're all connected. But uh, you'll find that with these prophecies. And then it tells us, um, by the way, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 8, speaking of the law of God, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. God never intended for the Jewish people to hang phylacteries with the Ten Commandments on their forehead. He meant it was to be in your mind, in your heart. He also says, thy word shall be in your heart. They didn't cut their chests open and put the word in there. In your hand meant in your actions in your heart, in your affections, in your mind, in your reason, in your worship. And so the seal of God is to be there. The number of saints that is sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes. Now are these literal Jews? I always get letters and make people angry when I say, no, yes they get the seal of God in their forehead but they are not literal Israelites. First of all, it's got 12,000, the exact same number from all the tribes. Long before Jesus was born, the king of Assyria came and he carried off 10 of the tribes. He left Benjamin and Judah, and the Levites were with them, but they were really like a 13th tribe in the southern kingdom. And he carried away 10 of the tribes. They largely were conquered. They intermarried. They lost their distinct identity. Yes, the children of Judah came back from the Babylonian captivity, but there were almost none of the other tribes existent that were pure bloods at that time. You can look at this census that you find given by Ezra when they identified those that came back from the captivity. Some of them came back intermarried with the Assyrians and they were called Samaritans. And they were looked down upon by the, um, the Jews in the time of Christ because they weren't pure Israelites anymore. So the idea that God has got 12,000 people from Issach Issachar and Naphtali or Zebulun, literal Israelites, I, it's, I think it's really a stretch. But the Bible is very clear about spiritual Israel. First of all, just to prove this point, the 12 apostles, were they from 12 different tribes? No, most of them were from the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, Matthew, Levi was probably from Levi, tribe of Levi. But there's no record of them being from Ephraim and, and uh, Manasseh or Joseph and you see what I'm saying? So even at the time of Christ, the 12 tribes represented the people of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. They were not looking for a great wave of people to reassemble the DNA from those tribes that had been carried off captive. So it makes me sad when I hear modern evangelical Christians say God is going to raise up 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. I'm going, where are they? Where are five from Manasseh in the last days? Pure, pure blood. And by the way, how many Jews are pure Jews today, even from the tribe of Judah? They've been scattered all over the world. You've got Jews that live in Ethiopia and they look like Ethiopians. I'm half Jewish. My father was American Indian and German and and so I guess that makes me typical American, right? And so the, the idea that they've got to be pure blood Jews, you can be one of the 144,000. See what I'm saying? And I can. Are they the only ones who are saved in the last days? Well, you know, I did a little research on this and, and I think if I'm not mistaken, there's almost 7 billion people in the world. Since I first started doing this study, we added a billion people to the world because I used to go by 6 billion and now we're nearing 7 billion and if there's only 144,000 saved out of 7 billion people in the world that puts your chances at like 1 in 48,000 or something or is it 480,000? You get out your calculator and you let me know but you probably have a better chance of winning the lottery than being one of the 144,000. Are they the only ones saved? No. What does it mean then? What do these names mean? Well 
they've got their, this sign in their forehead because it represents the name of God in their foreheads. They represent modern day apostles. Now when you look in the Bible at what Jesus says about the 12 apostles and then what he says about the 144,000 you'll see there's a lot of similarities. You notice it said, um, well let me just read some of my uh, notes to you on this here. First of all the 12 apostles were not from the 12 different tribes. They were, it, it was emphasized that they were Jews but they were to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In the last days the 144,000 are spiritual apostles, 12 times 12,000. Jesus used 12 men that he had trained and filled with his spirit following the preaching of John the Baptist who came in the power of Elijah to prepare the world, the nation of Israel for his first coming. In the last days there is going to be an army of people who will be coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. There will be 144,000 spiritual apostles that will prepare the world for the second coming. You see the, the parallel there? Um, when the number is complete and sealed there is a great revival and a great persecution. You notice in uh, Acts chapter 8 after all these people are baptized a great revival it says a great persecution arose at that time. Twelve apostles were the first fruits of Jesus first coming the 144,000 the first fruits regarding the second coming. By the way that's in Revelation 14 4 it calls them the first fruits. Um, thousands are converted un under the influence of the apostles at the first coming. A great multitude is converted under the influence of the 144,000. You remember what Jesus said about Nathaniel? Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He was one of the apostles. What does it say about the 144,000? They have no guile. God called the 12 apostles to be fishers of men and the last day the 144,000 are to be fishing around the world so to speak. The 12 apostles followed Jesus wherever he went. They had a special unique relationship with Jesus. In the last days 144,000 have a special relationship with Jesus. So someone always wants to ask, well is it a literal number? I think so. Uh, now I, I don't have an, an issue, I could be wrong. I don't want to argue with those who might see differently but did Jesus have a literal number of 12 apostles? When you read the numbers in Revelation is there a real value to them? While the seven churches represent the spiritual history of the church are there really seven cycles? Yeah, it's seven, phase of seven. When it talks about the 12 gates of the New Jerusalem is that spiritually 12 gates? Are there really 12 gates? When you talk about the 1260 years of persecution is that a spiritual number or does the number have real value? As you go through the numbers in Revelation I think I mentioned to you before Dr. Harding gave me a little clue um, let Dr. Leslie Harding he said the names in Revelation are almost always a spiritual analogy you go to the Old Testament to interpret them but the numbers have real value. So I have no problem with there being 144,000 real last day apostles. They're not the only ones saved which gives me hope, right? Suppose it is a literal number. I don't think you're going to see this group of 144,000 in the last days going around like marathon runners with a number on their back that says I'm 142,000. You know what I'm saying? So you may not identify them that way but when you get to the kingdom it talks about this 144,000 that surround the Lord. It always identifies them as a real group. Every other number that God applies in Revelation has a real value. So I'm inclined to think that but it shouldn't be a problem for you. Where it gets to be a problem is when people think they're the only ones saved. Then we get real nervous. That's just like the last day apostles. There's a great multitude that uh, will be saved as a result of that. I've got to pace myself because I've still got several more chapters here in Revelation. So they sing a special song before the Lord. Did the apostles sing with Jesus just before his trial in the Garden of Gethsemane? The Bible says so. They have a special relationship. You know what it says about the apostles? When they were tried for their faith they could look at them by their voice, by their boldness, by their theology. They knew they'd been with Jesus. They reflected the teachings and the character of Jesus. The 144,000 are going to be reflecting the image of Christ in the last days. 
And so, and all of the believers need to be reflecting the image of Christ also. Now one of the neat things about the 144,000, why does it tell us that these are 12,000 from the 12 tribes? And it lists those tribes, but it leaves two out. Hebrew names have meaning. All the names in the Bible have meaning. When they named the sons of Jacob, you can read about it in the Bible, there was a crisis going on. And for instance, when Leah first had uh, Judah, she said, I will praise the Lord. Actually, Reuben was first. And the word Reuben means God has looked on me. She, they made these statements. They uttered part of a sentence with every boy that was born. The list in Revelation is unique from any list. It doesn't start with the firstborn, which is Reuben. It starts with Judah. It doesn't list them in order of the size of the tribes. And it leaves out Dan and Ephraim. The Bible says Dan is a serpent in the way and Ephraim is joined to their idols. Both Dan and Ephraim were known to have given themselves over to idolatry. If there's one thing God speaks against in the Bible, it was idolatry. Revelation talks about worshiping an image. Daniel portrays the kingdoms of the world as a great image. Keep yourself from idols, little children, John tells us. Because it really, idolatry is all about worshiping the wrong God. And so Dan and Ephraim, it means these tribes had gone to idolatry. So they're left out. The tribes that are given in their order are Judah. What does Judah mean? I will praise the Lord. Reuben means God has looked on me. Gad means given good fortune. Asher means I am happy or happy am I. Naphtali, my wrestling or my struggle. Manasseh, making me to forget. I'm becoming more like Manasseh all the time. <laughs> Simeon, God hears me. Levi, joined or attached to me as in marriage. Issachar, purchased me. Zebulun, a dwelling. Joseph, God will add to me. Benjamin, son of his right hand. Now when you assemble those names, the way they're given in that order, it tells the story of the ultimate victory, the struggling and the victory of the church. Let me read it to you the way that that would appear. It says, I will praise the Lord for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. I put in the word and. I am happy because my wrestling God is making me forget. God hears me and is attached or joined to me. He has purchased me a dwelling and added to me the son of his right hand. It's the story of salvation. It's the story of the bridegroom and the bride in the Hebrew terminology. It's a wonderful picture. And so the 144,000, even the names that are given, is really talking about the victory of the church over their wrestlings and the marriage of the church to Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Revelation is such a phenomenal book. It is so filled with meaning that I could take each one of these chapters and just start bouncing back and forth to all the cross references in the Old Testament and we would be there a long time. All right, so 144,000 clear. Oh wait, we got one more thing. There's a great multitude at the end of chapter 7. Remember, they're not the only ones saved. It talks about and turn back to Revelation chapter 7 and um, in the bottom of the chapter there it says, after these things in verse 9, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. Here's this great multitude who is victorious and when John asks the attending angel, who are these in white robes? Or the angel asks him and he says, sir, you know, you tell me. He says in verse 14, these are the ones who have come out of great tribulation now the great tribulation in the Bible, there are two parts of great tribulation. There is a period of historic great tribulation that God's church goes through during the dark ages. I think most of us know about that from 538 to 1798. And then there is the great tribulation such as there never has been following the small time of trouble in the last days. And there's a great multitude that is converted from the influence of the 144,000 for that time. And so uh, not only do you have the 12 apostles in the upper room, you got 120, don't you, that are all filled with the Holy Spirit. In the last days, it's not just the 144,000. It's 
you got a, another multitude beyond that. And so cheer up if you thought there were only going to be 144,000 in the last days. All right, we need to move on now. You'll notice that we had to take a break here. We were studying through the seven seals. Then the seven seals are interrupted with this picture of the 144,000. Then it goes back to the seven seals again. Now, when you read Revelation, I can use my papers here to illustrate this. I didn't plan on it, but it's handy. This will really help you when you understand Revelation. It is not written chronologically. What Revelation does, as a matter of fact, a lot of Hebrew prophecies do this. It'll give you a prophecy, and then it will say, now, in order to understand this prophecy, we've got to back up. We're going to have some overlap. And it will overlap this prophecy with this prophecy. And then it'll say, now we're going to overlap this prophecy with this prophecy. And then we're going to overlap this prophecy with this prophecy. And so it's, and by the way, this is the best teaching technique, is it keeps reviewing and going back and moving on. And they overlap and they say, and now we're going to explain this next part with a little different picture. It's like you've got this object here, this truth that you want to examine and you walk around it from all these different sides. On one side you say, oh, I'm going to look at it over here and it's a calf, here it's a lion, here it's an eagle, here it's a man. You're looking at that one truth. And prophecy does that. So when you're done you get the big picture. Ultimately what is it revealing? The revelation of Jesus. It's telling us about Christ and the truth. He is the truth. The truth of God. All right. So then you get to chapter 8 and he opens the seventh seal. And there's silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, if a day equals a year in prophecy, and even in the Jewish economy, 360 days to a year, we know that because three and a half years was 42 months. 360 days in a prophetic lunar year. Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in the day? 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. That means that if you are going to say, what is one hour? One hour is 15 days prophetically. Half an hour is what? Seven and a half days. So one way you might say seven days is about the space of half an hour. So this is talking about a seven day period. See what I'm saying? I've heard that the journey to heaven is going to take about a week. I read that somewhere. Now, here there's silence in heaven. Why is there silence in heaven? Well, a lot of reasons. When you read in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, there was silence sometimes as the people prayed outside and the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. There was a great awesome time. Sometimes on a battlefield, before two armies engage, there is a great still. People know that folks are about to die and there's a great quiet. These trumpets are about to blow and it's like there's a silence, there's an awesomeness, a time. And as Christ comes to get His church and heaven is vacated, there's going to be silence in heaven during that time too. There's no intercession going on. Christ is not there interceding. The heavenly temple is vacated. God the Son, God the Father, and all the angels have come to earth. And so when it speaks of this silence in heaven, that's a very awesome time. And after it talks about that, it says in verse 3, another angel came having a golden censer, and he came and he stood at the altar. And there was given him much incense that he should offer it with prayers of the saints upon the golden altar. You've got the altar of incense. You've got the golden altar that was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense of the prayers of the saints ascended before God and in the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar. This is holy fire. And he threw it to the earth. You remember when Nadab and Abihu brought common fire that had not been ignited by God? And fire came from God out of heaven and burnt them up. And he threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And so here it's painting this great ominous picture of uh, what's going to happen here at the end. Then it backs up now and it gives this military history. Remember, Revelation is covering the history of God's people. We're historists. We believe in the history of the, the historic interpretation. Covering the first coming to the second coming of Jesus. 
those perspectives are given through a variety of visions. The spiritual history is given in the seven churches. The political history is given in the seven seals. And then you've got the military history in the seven trumpets. Now, with much trepidation, I tiptoe into the seven trumpets. But I'm going to tiptoe out pretty quick because it, it, it is probably one of the most controversial subjects in our church about how do you interpret that. And you know, I, I do think that um, uh, there are some dates that are given and battles that are given and people try to pinpoint things exactly and uh, there are some dubious attachments, but something I do feel confident about is the seven trumpets are talking about a great battle that is taking place prior to the deliverance of God's people. Now keep in mind, when do you find seven trumpets in the Bible? Get your computer out, type in seven trumpets. What's the first thing that's going to pop up? When they were about to take the promised land and God's people were going through the wilderness, prior to leaving the wilderness, they had to blow seven trumpets. They were on the wilderness side of the Jordan. The army crossed over. The first beachhead was Jericho. If they couldn't conquer Jericho, they couldn't get a beachhead into the promised land and take possession of the promised land. Jericho was that crucial battle. Seven priests blowing those seven ram horn trumpets went around the city seven times on the seventh day and they blew the trumpet and they shouted the walls came down and they took the city. Trumpets were something that indicated a time of war. By the way, that's Joshua chapter 6 verse 4. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn. The seventh day you march around the city seven times. They also blew trumpets during the Jubilee. It meant liberation and freedom. Trumpets were blown on the Day of Atonement, time of judgment. All of those things play into this story. You read in the book Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 19. Oh my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. So trumpets often meant war. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall know how to prepare for the battle? Now today, what does our military do? They got walkie-talkies and they got headphones and they go and they give messages to each other and that wasn't the way in Bible times. The way they'd communicate is they would signal with trumpets and we still sort of remember that today. Some of you were in the military. I went to military school. I remember waking up for years hearing over the loudspeaker. They, we didn't have a real bugler and it was always and it just... And at the end of the day, when curfew came, we would hear over the loudspeaker, and I, I learned how to do that because sometimes I was the speaker. <laughs> but, uh, and so signals were given in the military, and on the battlefield, some of you, I went to military school, when I went to New York Military Academy, we still had horses in a cavalry. And I wanted so much to have a horse, but I, my dad said it was a waste of money, and I was so mad, and now, I agree he was right. I got, got older, got my own horses, and I thought I should have listened to my father. But uh, anyway, sorry, Rich. <laughs> Rich has horses. But uh, they used to give signals from the horse. And how many of you remember when it looked like the people in the fort were going to be challenged by, destroyed by, uh, you know, you used to be able to say cowboys and Indians, but that's not politically correct anymore. But you know, you used to hear, praise the Lord, the cavalry's coming to save us from the Indians and they'd go that was a signal for what? Charge! And so they used to give signals back then with the trumpets. So these trumpets are signaling the fall of the enemy of God's people to prepare the way for entering the promised land. The first four trumpets represent the fall of the Western Roman Empire that happened in stages because Rome, pagan Rome, had been persecuting God's people. They were firsthand on the scene and crucifying Jesus. The, the Romans 
the great persecution in the Colosseum. They were burning the Christians at the stake, right? So there's this great persecution. Now this happened, and you know, I recommend you read uh, Gibbon's History of the Roman Empire, and there's some great books on this. James White wrote a great book on this. Uriah Smith wrote a great book on this. The history is fascinating. There's no way I'm going to have time to read to you all the little uh, specifics of these battles that happen, but how they tie in with the different prophecies. I might give you one or two examples. Um, you've got Alaric under that first trumpet battle. It says, the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now there's a lot of people that take the seven trumpets and they try to make them environmental catastrophes in the last days before Jesus comes. When you read Revelation, the purpose of Revelation has nothing to do with what's going on with our environment. I'm sorry, I care about the environment. Well, there's one exception. There is that um, verse that says God will destroy those that destroy the earth. But for the most part, it's not talking about we're cutting down the trees and so God's coming back. It's not talking about we've polluted the ocean so God's coming back. The air is getting dirty so God's coming back. The message of Revelation is not a message about a meteor that falls to the earth or an asteroid. Some people think the flaming mountain is like a volcano top that's going to blow off and hit the ocean from, I mean, and I, there may be volcanoes and there may, I don't know, I don't think they're asteroids, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's some of these natural disasters, they're happening around us right now. What more do you want than we have now? If you're waiting for natural disasters to tell you Jesus is coming, you should have been fainting with excitement a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell your friends, we're seeing apocalyptic images. I've got that dish now that gets Korea BN, the amazing facts, and, and that array of satellites, Christian satellites. I also get two international news stations for free. One of them is Al Jazeera, the other is Russia today, but they're both English. And the images that they're sending back of Pakistan right now, they're saying there are more people affected by this just absolutely apocalyptic flood in Pakistan than uh, the tsunami of 2004, the Haiti earthquake, the Chile earthquake, the Mexico earthquake, all put together. 20 million people right now are without food. They can't travel. They're surrounded by mosquito-infested water and sewage, and they can't get the relief to them. 20 million people, and they say the relief is not coming very fast from the international country, community, because many are wondering if it's a judgment on Pakistan who's been ostensibly helping the Taliban. Now I'm not weighing in on that, I'm just telling you what the news report said. But I saw these dear people, they tried to bring a relief truck to them. And they're trying to distribute, and the people are sweating. Any of you see these images I'm talking about? American news is not showing it. I don't know why, or very little of it. It was on PBS. And the starving people are like r animals are swarming these relief trucks and they're pulling the distributors of people who are distributing the relief, pulling them off the truck, pulling each other off, men and women and children fighting for the food. There are 20 million people out there like that that are starving. And people say, well, you know, one of these days it's going to get really bad and then we'll know Jesus is coming. I don't know how bad you want it to get. You, you, you know, it's like, you know, uh, if you're out of a job, it's a recession. If I'm out of a job, it's a depression. <laughs> and if it's happening somewhere else, these are bad times. We, it's like we're waiting for it to happen to us, and then we'll think the end is near. Well, friends, I'll tell you, if you were in Pakistan right now, you'd think the end was near. Or if you were in Haiti a few months ago, you would think the end was near. Uh, these things are happening in quick succession. So, back to uh, the first trumpet. Well, I got a ways to go. And so you've got the, um, the first four trumpets really address the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. The fifth and sixth trumpets deal with the Mohammedan hordes, the fall of, or the attack on the papal Roman Empire and papal Christianity under the Ottoman Empire and the rise of Islam, which we're still seeing that. Uh, it's interesting to some of these, for instance, you read the second trumpet, which happened under uh, Gennesaret. And it says, the second angel sounded, and there was a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. Well, Alaric came from the land. Uh, Gen uh, 
Gennesaret came from the sea and it tells about in history three years were spent building the greatest fleet of ships that had been built. They stripped forests to do it and all of those ships sank in one day. Three years worth of ships that took forests to build. I mean this is some of the history why it talks about these great battles from the sea, battles from the land. Little by little the power that had persecuted God's people was brought down. Now if you know your Bible prophecy, when you get into the metal image of Daniel and you get to the iron, what does iron represent? And then it transitions from the iron into iron and clay which represents, well it represents pagan Rome mixed together with Christianity or papal Rome and that makes that same material goes right down into the toes. Toes are the end of the image, right? So you got two phases of the Roman power and the divisions of the Roman power right to the end of time when the mountain comes. The stone cut out of the mountain, right? And so what the seven trumpets are showing us is the breakdown and disillusion of those powers which is still going on right now. We're living right now in the time of the sixth trumpet. And by the way, um, part of that sixth trumpet it tells us about an army of 200 million that will destroy a third of humanity. Now when it talks about a third of humanity it's using the global sense of the word. I'll tell you right now friends that um, I don't understand all about this but I am certain that the tension in the world today between the Christian world and you call it Western civilization and Islam is reaching a fever pitch. There is a way and a place that you're going to find Islam playing into these final events and it's talking about just some tremendous battles. Ultimately it talks about this trumpet blowing and the, the river Euphrates dries up. Now you've got to know your Bible history to understand this. When God's people were captives in Babylon the Medo-Persian kingdom had surrounded the city of Babylon and uh, the Persians under Cyrus and the Medes under uh, Cyrus also. The only way into the city was through the Euphrates River and they diverted the Euphrates River, it says to make way for the kings of the east. When Cyrus and Darius the Mede, when they came into the city and they liberated the Jews, God's people were allowed to go to the promised land when those kings came. So when you understand Jewish history and it talks about drying up the Euphrates River, I think that's got uh, very important significance telling us that the resources, the life that has fueled Babylon is going to be cut off. It's all happening with Babylon will not get its power anymore and God's people are liberated. Ultimately it's talking about the battle between, the spiritual battle between uh, the forces of good and evil between those who follow God and those who don't. Don't missle, miss, uh, you know, and I could say more about Attila the Hun and the dissolution of the Roman Empire, the Senate, but um, don't miss all of the similarities between when you read the trumpets and what happened during the deliverance of God's people. First trumpet talks about fire mingled with thunders and lightning do you know that's also in the plagues that happened on Egypt before God's people get, got out? So you'll notice in all of these plagues you'll find verbiage and language that was in the plagues that fell on Egypt. Even in the trumpets a lot of the same language is used that was a kind of a, a harbinger of the deliverance of God's people. All right, going to move on now. Then you've got a little book that you read about in chapter 10. It talked about the plagues on the wicked in chapters 9, 8 and 9 dealing with the seven trumpets and by the way we haven't gotten to the seventh trumpet. That's part of the overlap that comes. Seventh seal was postponed until a later chapter. Seventh trumpets postponed until chapter 11. There's a pause. We're living in that pause right now. And it talks about a little book. You see it might have looked like the end had come long before now and many had prophesied and predicted that it would. But here John is told by this angel and turn with me to Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head, face like the sun, feet like pillars of fire, a little book in his hand. 
He sets his right hand, foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. All the kingdoms come out of the land or the sea. This angel's got authority over all. And he cries with a loud voice, and like a ro lion roars. And when he cried out, the seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. We'll know them someday, but not now. And the angel who I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his head to heaven, and he swore by him. He makes this proclamation with the highest oath possible. He swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that they should be, there should be delay no longer. I think it's interesting, right about the time of chapter 10, is dealing with a time of a great awakening that takes place. The great Bible societies, a great revival, the great Advent movement. I'm not even speaking about the Seventh-day Adventists here. I'm talking about many who thought Christ was coming. Right during that time is also a birth of a movement that denies that God is creator. So I think it's not an accident that it emphasizes the one who created the heavens and the earth. He created, created, created. It's telling us he created it because a big movement, a counter movement is coming from the devil during this time saying he didn't create it. And the angel saying, I say by God, I'm vowing, I'm making an oath by God that he is a creator and that you have more time in this world and you still have a message to give. And so he tells him, he takes his book he says, I want you to eat this book. Now you read in Ezekiel, it talks about a little book that was eaten. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll or the scroll. And he said, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat. Fill thy bowels with the roll that I give thee. And I did eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Isn't the word of God compared to honey? The law of the Lord compared to honey? but then it became bitter. Why? You try sharing it with others and you run into opposition. You know there was a, this great Advent movement where they were proclaiming the coming of the Lord and then they realized they had made a big mistake. Back in the days of Christ when he came the first time and he talked about the kingdom of heaven at hand, the disciples were so excited, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, what did they think was going to happen? Jesus is going to go through a metamorphosis and all of a sudden he's, we've seen him flash his divinity before. He's going to flash his divinity. He's going to march into Jerusalem. He's going to overthrow Herod and Pilate. He's going to sit down on the throne of David. He's going to feed the armies with bread from heaven. We're going to march out against the Romans. We will have the kingdom of the world will be in Jerusalem once again. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you realize they were still believing that up until after the resurrection. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to us? Great disappointment. Jesus said, no, you still must prophesy a little longer. So the message of the gospel was sweet, but it was bitter because they had to keep preaching. Back in the 1800s, there was a great awakening, the great discovery of the prophecies, a great revival movement. And they thought Jesus was coming because they misapplied some verses. And he didn't come. And the angel said, you must still prophesy. It's not yet. And so this was, chapter 10 is telling about this phase of history when they had to keep presenting the gospel. Chapter 11. Now I don't need to get all the way through chapter 11 because part of chapter 11 is when the seventh trumpet blows. But I want to talk about the two witnesses very quickly. In Revelation chapter 11, it identifies these two witnesses who are uh, persecuted. And it says in uh, verses 2 and 3, they were, temple was to be measured, but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Holy city is representing where God's people dwell. For 42 months, you're going to find that time period, 42 months, Jewish months, 30 days, 1,260 days, a time, one year, complete cycle of the seasons, a time me, means, a times means a pair of years, so you got one plus a couple is three, and a dividing or a half of a time, three and a half years, 42 months, 
1260 days, that time period is given several times in the Bible. That's how long the famine lasted in the days of Elijah. That's the time period the book of Esther begins with when they depose the pagan queen and then Esther is chosen. It's the time period of Jesus preaching. It's the time period of the apostles preaching to the Jews. It's a prophetic time period of persecution when the word of God is hidden from the people from 538 to 1798, still prophesying in sackcloth, the Word of God. What is sackcloth? You know, right now, you, they don't have potato bags anymore like they used to have. Now if you have a potato bag race, you've got to put on a hefty garbage bag. But they used to have potato sacks. Anyone remember what burlap is? And burlap was a, a fabric, it's just a coarse fabric. They used it for animal feed sacks back in Bible times. It goes back to antiquity. Sackcloth they called it. It's rough. You don't want to wear it. When they were mourning they put on sackcloth because it was real itchy. And um, it was uncomfortable. It was almost a way to punish yourself. But if you put sackcloth over a lamp some light would still get out but it would be diminished. During the Dark Ages, God's truth was still getting out. It was still prophesying, but it was being obscured. It was being oppressed by these powers. So it prophesied in sackcloth. Who are the two witnesses? It's the Word of God. The Word of God, we call it sometimes the New and the Old Testament, and that's fine. Uh, the Bible doesn't refer to it that way. The Bible typically refers to it as the Law and the Prophets. The Old Testament ends with a great prophecy. It says, remember the law of Moses my servant that I gave unto him, Malachi chapter 4 verse 4, for all Israel with its statutes and judgments. Behold I send you Elijah the prophet. Moses the law, Elijah the prophets. Now then it tells about t something terrible that's going to happen to these two witnesses. If you got your Bibles in chapter 11, it uh, talks about them being uh, dishonored and abused and, and I know some dear evangelical friends that think that Moses and Elijah are coming back down to earth literally going to get mortal bodies back they're going to be killed again, they're going to be mutilated and they're going to lay in the streets of the world and you know I can understand why they think that because these two witnesses do represent Moses and Elijah figuratively. Who appeared what two witnesses appeared to Jesus to endorse his being the Messiah on the Mount of Transfiguration? It's Moses and Elijah. They represent the law and the prophets. Bind up the testimony. What is a testimony? It tells us the spirit of prophecy. Seal the law among my disciples. Two characteristics of God's church in the last days. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the law, and have the testimony of Jesus. Testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The law and the prophets. The Moses and Elijah are a symbol of that, but they're not literally coming down. It represents the Bible. The Bible is dual in its nature. It's symbolized by what kind of sword? A two-edged sword. It gives us perspective. And so these two witnesses are persecuted. It says their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city, I'm in verse 8, that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. Now he makes it clear it's spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Why Egypt? Remember what the Pharaoh said? Moses said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. And in Sodom, the promiscuity and immorality. Well, this is telling about what happened at this time. Do you realize up until the revolution of France, every nation in the world officially believed in God. Some God, but they all believed in God. The birth of atheism happened during the French Revolution. First nation that had the audacity to say there is no God. They even tried to change the days of the week. They burned Bibles in the street. What happened to the Word of God, the two witnesses? They were defamed. And it, just terrible things were done. They tore them up and they uh, did sacrilegious things and they said Christ is dead. They carried statues of Jesus up the street and said burn the wretch. I mean it was a nation that had gone mad during the French Revolution with atheism. And you know they've never quite recovered from that. To this day, and I've been to Paris more than once, 
Um, they say, you know, Paris is a city of, of love. There's a city of immorality, too. Uh, sex over there is like shaking hands. And um, it, it's, there's a lot of atheism there. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on science. And I'm thankful for Louis Pasteur and some of their discoveries, but at the same time, they were very bold and defiant and said, Who is the Lord? There is no God. And that spread from there. But it was an attack on the Word of God. Well, that lasted for about three and a half years, three and a half days, it says here in prophecy. And then they realized that the French Revolution was a disaster, and they once again allowed religion back in the kingdom. And so the Word of God was exalted back to heaven. But you look at the characteristics of the two witnesses, and it says, notice, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of all the earth. Zechariah 4, verse 2 and 3 says that almost um, identically. What kept the lamps burning in the temple? Olive oil. And these lamps, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouths and devours their enemies. Do you remember when Elijah said, if I'm a prophet, let fire come down from heaven and burn you up? Do you remember where, yeah, it says that in the Bible. He did it three times. You remember where Moses said, Oh, during the time of Moses, fire came down and burned up Nadab and Baihu because he said not to take strange fire. And the earth swallowed up uh, Datham and Abiram. And so you look at the plagues that are identified here and you find them with Elijah and Moses and you find them in the Bible. You find plagues in the Old Testament. You find plagues in the New Testament. It says they have the power to shut up heaven. You find drought in the Old Testament and famine. You find drought and famine in the New Testament. And so the characteristics, all the characteristics of these two witnesses are the Word of God. And then it tells what happens to those that reject the Word of God. It compares them to Sodom and Egypt, two cities that persecuted um, God's people and rejected the truth. Well, when we uh, get back again, we'll probably have to blow the seventh trumpet, but I've never been able to find a good way to end these sessions of study except to say we'll have to stop now. Hi friends, Amazing Facts is so excited to tell you about our new Prophecy Study Bible. It's filled with everything you could ever want in a Bible. It's got the maps, red letter edition, concordance, and all 27 of the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides are in here to help you in your personal study and to help you study the Word with your friends. If you'd like to know how you can get a copy of this incredible study Bible, call the toll-free number on the screen or go to our website, amazingfacts.org. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org.